Well, hello everyone. Uh, on behalf of Georgetown Law, I wanna welcome you to our conversation on constitutional priorities in the first 100 days. Uh, my name is Neil Katyal uh, and I'm joined by my colleague, Paul Clement. Uh, and Paul, it's always good to see you. Likewise, Neil, it's great to see you. This will be fun. Cool. So um, we both served in the Solicitor General's office during past transitions. And so I think we should probably start by digging in a little bit onto what's happening in that front and how this transition might be different than past transitions. Um, and maybe we'll talk a little about some of the specific cases that could be impacted by the change in the administration. And, you know, I think given that there's another impeachment trial about to begin, maybe we should talk a little about that too. So um, maybe before getting into all that, um, Paul, would you just mind introducing yourself to, to the audience? Sure, I'd be happy to, Neil. So uh, my name is Paul Clement, and I'll spare you the whole biography. I'll just talk about two things that are relevant for today's presentation. Um, first is just the Georgetown connection. I am both a Georgetown undergrad uh, and somebody who has been teaching at the law school in various capacities uh, since uh, the Clinton impeachment, since 1998. That's, uh, that's when I first started teaching a separation of powers class at the law school. So that affiliation runs deep and um, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, just the second aspect of my bio that's relevant is uh, my service in the Solicitor General's office. Um, I spent seven years in the Solicitor General's office all during the uh, Bush administration, Bush, the second Bush administration or Bush 43 as we called it. Um, and perhaps most relevantly for today's discussion, um, you know, I was there from almost the beginning. Um, I, I came into the office in February of 2001. So, you know, I was in the office before uh, Ted Olson was there because it took him a while to get confirmed. So I definitely saw from the inside a little bit of what the transition in the office looked like from the Clinton administration to the Bush administration. And I know for some of the students that's ancient history. Uh, but I still think it's uh, it's reasonably relevant to uh, thinking about what's going on today. Neil? Cool. Um, so my name is Neil Katyal, as I said. Uh, I've taught law at Georgetown for uh, more than 20 years. Um, and my first class, actually it was my second class, was while Paul was teaching his seminar, I taught a class called Clinton. And it was about all the legal issues uh, surrounding uh, him. Uh, and it was ongoing at the time of the impeachment trial. And I had basically everyone stop by the class from Bob Bennett, who was the president's lawyer and Ken Starr, who was the independent counsel, Monica Lewinsky came to the class. Um, so um, it's one of the things I love about Georgetown and teaching here is just our ability to just bring people in from all over. Um, I too served in the Solicitor General's office uh, as principal deputy and as acting SG, not for seven years, for about two and a half. And in total, I've argued 43 cases at the court, which I think is about like one third of Paul's, um, basically. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm trying to catch up, but it's going to take me a long, long time. Um, uh, but I started actually on January 20th uh, in the Obama administration, so on day one. And so, uh, you know, I was also there for that entire transition time. Uh, you know, then Solicitor General Elena Kagan wasn't confirmed until around March 20th. And so I had to think through all of these questions and run that process um, for the, the first couple of months. Um, and so um, with that, maybe I'll just start there and I'll say, you know, um, you know, I think a lot of people think of the Justice Department and the Solicitor General's office as being so politicized, but Paul had ran that office for basically seven, seven and a half years, then Greg Gar right before I came in. And I remember right when the news of my uh, appointment was announced, um, maybe one of the first two or three calls I got was from Greg, the Solicitor General at the time for President Bush, who said, I just want to help you let's get together and um, go over everything in the office. And I remember we went and we went to a Barnes and Noble and Starbucks and found a quiet corner and spent, he walked me through everything for four or five hours. It was the classiest thing. Um, and uh, I walked in on January 20th. I think that was, our meeting was around the 18th. I walked in on the 20th, scared out of my mind, but also like I had a really good appreciation for what 
was going on in the office because he had taken the time to walk me through it in such a really helpful way. And, um, you know, the office only has 16 uh, uh, line attorneys in it. And again, this, there were some perceptions that the Bush Justice Department was politicized in its career hiring. I found none of that in the 16 attorneys that Paul, you and Greg, you know, hired. It was just the 16 greatest attorneys. I think if anything, they probably skewed a little to the left because, you know, great ones do. But, um, uh, you know, uh, it was really remarkable. And, you know, that's what I think about the Solicitor General's office is just kind of non-political, even-handed administration of the law. And you, you and Greg really carried that out. Um, so with that, could you talk a little, Paul, about the SG's office and kind of what it's about, its functions, history, and the like? Sure. No, I'd be happy to. And, you know, you've already highlighted that there is this real sort of cadre of career lawyers that are the real, you know, the bread and butter. They are the, they're the lifeblood of the office. And I think if you think about the Solicitor General's office compared to even some of the other great offices in the Justice Department, like the Office of Legal Counsel, um, the, the Solicitor General's office is really pretty unique because there are so many career lawyers and so few political lawyers, politically appointed lawyers um, in the office. The, the only people who are uh, political appointees who change from administration to administration are the Solicitor General and the principal Solicitor General. So the rest of the office, the career deputies, all of the si assistants, they carry over from administration to administration. And I think that for kind of obvious reasons is part of the reason that you typically don't see lots of positions change from administration to administration because you've already had those positions sort of embraced and then articulated in brief sometimes by lawyers who have been in the office for years and years and years. And so if you think about somebody like the senior career deputy in the office, Ed Needler, I mean, he's literally been in the Justice Department since the Carter administration. So this is, you know, I'm not going to try to do the math on the fly, but this is, you know, his umpteenth uh, transition. There's nothing new. There's nothing he hasn't seen. And so there's all that kind of institutional knowledge in the office. And then just to Neil's point, um, you know, certainly kind of my philosophy when I was in the office and in a position to hire people for the career spots is that you really didn't want to take kind of politics into account or skew the hiring for two reasons. I mean, one was just because it would be contrary to the long traditions of the office. And that would have been sufficient onto the day. But there's also sort of a self-interested view, which is, you know, you want lawyers in the office both in the process of coming up with your position and also in the moot courts um, who, you know, sort of think like the whole court. I mean, I think, you know, in, in, in the Bush administration, it would have been a real disservice to have, you know, just nothing but Scalia clerks filling in the ranks um, in the same way I think it would have been a disservice in the Obama administration to have, you know, sort of nothing but, you know, Breyer clerks. And, if anything, you know, maybe this is why that if anything, this, you know, you said that the, the, the office skewed a little left because brilliant lawyers uh, think that way. You know, I beg to differ for obvious reasons, but I think if it skewed that way for any reason, it may have been because I figured I already had a pretty good sense of how Justice Scalia thought. So where, where I needed more help was by hiring people who had clerked for justices on the left side of the court and the like. And so it just there are all sorts of reasons why you had that sort of balance in the, uh, in the office. So let me just say a few words about kind of my experience during transition and then maybe kick it back uh, to Neil to talk about kind of his thoughts on maybe to the extent things are different this time around. Um, but my experience was very similar to Neil's and in a way it was even more dramatic because at the beginning of the Bush administration, uh, the person who was serving as the acting solicitor general was the principal deputy uh, from the end of the Clinton administration, Barbara Underwood, who's now the state solicitor general for the state of New York. And now Barbara's situation was a little unusual because she took that uh, principal deputy position after serving in a career position in the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Eastern District of New York. Um, so she was in that sense sort of an unusual principal deputy. 
But still, I think people thought that the transition from one administration to another administration in the SG's office could be sufficiently sort of smooth and not involve sort of disruptive changes in position to the extent that the new administration thought it would make sense to have somebody who served in one of the two political roles in the previous administration served as the acting solicitor general um, until Ted Olson was appointed. So when I came in, I was working as the principal deputy uh, with Barbara. Now, obviously I was coming in with the new administration. So, um, you know, there were, you know, I had a prior relationship with the attorney general that Barbara didn't have. So, you know, I was probably serving in a slightly different capacity than typical, but, but, you know, not only did I get to have sort of, um, you know, coffee with, uh, with Greg Gar, but, I, you know, I got to meet every day with Barbara and we worked that process through, I think, you know, essentially seamlessly, uh, until Ted got there, um, Ted Olson, um, in June. Um, and then what I would say is, you know, more generally, and, and, and I think this is, you know, very consistent with Neil's experience, but I, I don't have to put words in him in his mouth because he's right here. But, you know, the, it wasn't when we came in that there were wholesale changes position in a large number of cases. To the contrary, I'm not sure there was a single case where we had taken a position in a Supreme Court brief that we then sort of changed in the Supreme Court. Now, I think there were one or two cases and really only one or two that I remember where the, the prior administration had taken a position in a lower court brief that had been reviewed or approved by the Solicitor General's office. And by the time that same case came up to the Supreme Court, uh, the office had a different position. But I, you know, I can certainly count on one hand, I can really only re remember maybe one or two cases. And they were the cases where, frankly, you'd expect it. Like, you know, I think one of the cases where I know we took a different position, we being the Justice Department, it took a different position in the lower court and the Supreme Court was the University of Michigan affirmative action cases. And whatever you think about that issue, you probably can maybe suspect that that's gonna change when there's a transition from a Republican administration to a Democratic administration or vice versa. But other than that, on just the vast, vast majority of the issues, even some that were controversial, even some where the Bush administration, if it was writing on a clean slate, might have come out differently, the position was not changed and sort of the continuity was preserved, which I think reflects well on the, uh, on, 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 on the office. But Neil, maybe you can talk just a little bit more about your experience and then to the extent you perceive things to be different right now um, yeah, um, about so, that as well. First of all, as you think about the office, uh, what you're talking about about the office, now it's different than the Office of Legal Counsel or something like that. It's 100% right. Um, not just because of its relatively non-political staff, but also because its function, and this is implicit in what you're saying, but I just wanna make it explicit for the audience. Your function is you have an audience. It's nine people at one first street. It's just different than any other government job because you know if you're at the OLC, you're off, you're, you know, your audience is the president or something like that, but you've got these nine people they are stable year after year after year after year. And what that means is your credibility as an institution is at it is, is the most important asset you have. You know, you're not, if you're the Solicitor General's office, you're not like every other litigant, or at least you shouldn't be that way. And, and one reason you're not that way is because you understand there are long-term interests of the United States government that don't depend on who the president is. And so that does then come, you know, not just in the positions that are being taken, but of the people that you hire. Exactly, Paul, I tended to skew and hire a bit more conservative, I think, because I was like, well, I, I kind of know how I think. I need to know how the rest of the court, you know, thinks and, and, and so on. So, you know, I think that's why, you know, that, that's why our hiring practices looked a little bit um, the way that they did. Um, when I came in on January 20th, as I said, I had that five hour or so meeting with Greg beforehand. And then I went through policy after po or brief after brief um, and to try and you know, see, is there anything that we would uh, be changing? And um, 
Uh, I was principal deputy like you, I was not acting. We had decided that Ed Needler should, should be the acting. Um, we, you know, we had a pretty much a general view that the positions that had been taken in the last administration were reasonable, that there wasn't any need to have an acting person who was a political appointee. Um, and so we didn't, we, we didn't do that. And at the end of the day, I looked through the briefs and this is now pretty public you know, or very public, we didn't change position in a single case, not one. Um, and I think that, you know, is a credit to the way that you all ran the office, um, you know, and, um, and a credit to the Office of the Solicitor General more generally and just trying to come up with the right uh, position for uh, the United States. Um, there were, I think, two instances that became pretty public. Um, one was a brief in the DNA testing case um, and which I think was a pretty aggressive position that the department had floated there. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, but we decided to do it here. And then the other was don't ask, don't tell that horrible military policy that excluded um, uh, out, uh, gay folks from serving in the military and their uh, Solicitor General Elena Kagan decided to continue defending it as the Bush administration had, uh, even though uh, there were deep, deep policy disagreements um, with it. Um, I think that this administration faces something very different than what you or I had. Um, this past Solicitor General's office um, in the Trump administration, you know, and I don't know if it's the Solicitor General that was driving this or the White House, and that's an interesting dynamic I want to talk about in a minute, but I think, you know, change positions like candy in so many case after case from the long-term interests of the Justice Department and the long-term positions of the department. And so if you're, if you're someone who is an institutionalist, as you know, I think the acting Solicitor General Elizabeth Pologer is, she served as an assistant in the office, very reasonable. It's a different thing than the question we had because the question we had was, do you deviate from this position which does reflect the longstanding interests of the Justice Department? Now you've got, should we deviate from the position that's been filed in court which itself deviated from the long-term interests of the Justice Department? And that's a very different question. And then you've got that credibility piece on the other side, as I started out by saying, you know, you've got this audience of nine people. It's always difficult to flip a position, particularly in an ongoing case, um, but the Trump administration did that in, in several. Um, but now to flip it again, back to what the original long-term position is, is I think, um, you know, probably called for if you are an institutionalist. So just to take one, example of this, and Paul, you know this better than anyone, uh, the Affordable Care Act. Um, you know, there is arguably a small, you know, a, a tiny flaw in the act at this point, um, you know, and uh, in the, you know, whether or not, you know, you debate whether or not that flaw exists or not. But uh, the Trump administration took the view that because of that flaw, the entire kit and caboodle, the whole thing, had to be struck down uh, as unconstitutional. That you know, to use the legal lingo, it's not severable from the rest of the act. And I can't think of any solicitor general, living or dead, who would take uh, that position. Um, and uh, yet they did. So, like, that's a good example to me of where you know you don't want to change positions from the past administration if you can't, but if you've got some outlier position, you're almost really compelled to as an institutionalist. So, you know, I don't know, Paul, whether you want to talk about that example or more generally, but maybe I'll just stop here. Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk about that example and I'll talk about it kind of more generally because, you know, I think that, that you know, you're right. The situation now is different from the situations that, that we face. And so I think that, you know, the, the, the issue is going to be one that, you know, that, that, that the new acting solicitor general and, you know, counseled presumably by Ed Needler and others are going to need to think about, you know, long and hard. I think it's, it's a really, I think it's going to be really important. And it's, a, it's, it's, it's going to be important if the office wants to change positions to what they perceive to be the long-term interests of the office, um, that, they, that they pick the right cases. 
Um, and I think that um, they also, I think, need to be a little bit careful about kind of how many they pick and, you know, and, and, and which ones. You know, sort of the ideal scenario, presumably, would be to change back into a position that is both obviously consistent with the long term views of the office and institutional interests of the government and is going to win. Um, because, you know, when you change position and win, it looks different in the end than if you change position and lose. And, you know, the, the, obviously the Solicitor General's office across administrations, you know, you, as you said, you have an audience of nine and you have to understand that, you know, in some administrations, the nine are gonna be more sympathetic to some of your positions than, you know, maybe a different administration's positions if, if the policies were different. I mean, you know, it's probably a little bit tougher for me to make some arguments about, you know, the war on terror given the court that I had, I think that the Biden administration is going to have to realize that they're making arguments to a, you know, reasonably conservative court. So, you, you know, if you're, if you're thinking about the ideal sort of target, it would be one where kind of everybody can see that the position you're re-embracing or embracing is in the long-term interest of the government and where you end up winning. Um, and I guess in that respect, it seems like the ACA case is a pretty good, um, you know, target um, because it, it, you know, and and obviously this is something that you know you and I could talk for an hour about, uh, but you know it 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 has been the long term position of the Justice Department to defend the constitutionality of statutes whenever reasonable arguments can be made. I think that consistent with what you said. I think it's always been understood that as a corollary of that, I mean, even if you think that part of a statute is unconstitutional, it would be in the sort of long-term sort of traditions of the office to have as little of the statute as possible fall as unconstitutional. Um, and so, you know, so I think switching positions in that respect um, would, I think, be identified by almost everyone as, you know, yeah, that's what the Justice Department does. And the Justice Department, in my view, tends to get itself in trouble when it deviates from that tradition. Um, so it would be great to see that uh, kind of reaffirmed. And I think the justices would welcome it. Um, I also think it's a really strong position. And so, you know, you know I'll you go out on a limb. Just clarify for the reader, for the viewers, what yeah, you mean. Yes, yeah. no, I was using a shorthand. It's good. I, I think that the argument, if, if they change positions and said that the, the entire statute doesn't fall, and that you know that that you don't have essentially zero severability in the Affordable Care Act. Um, you know, I think that, based on just my read of the law and the oral argument, you know, that's the position that's likely to prevail. So I think that that you know this this sort of fits what I would say is the model of a case where you know the preconditions are met. Um, the only thing that makes this this one a little bit hard is just the timing. Um, you know, if if the if if the if there was still a brief to be filed, um, it would be you know super easy to uh, you know file a brief that took a different position. If it were the position were announced, but the brief hadn't been filed, it would be the easiest thing in the world to file a different brief. You know, this case is fully briefed and argued. So so maybe I can just ask you, Neil, like what you know what what do you think is if they were going to change their position, what's what's the right way? To manifest that change of position, because I, I I don't think the answer's right in the Supreme Court rules. Um, yeah, I, I think, I think they think I need to think it through. I think it's a supplemental brief, which is permitted under the rules. Um, definitely permitted. What? Oh no, I said definitely permitted. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I think that's probably the right format in which it should be done. And again, I don't think it's something you do lightly, but this case just, you know, I mean, you and I are agreeing on this. I mean, I think it fits it to a T. One complicating fact about this case is that the acting solicitor general, I think, might be recused from it because she filed a brief in the case when she was in private practice. That then leads to a kind of complicated question of, well, what happens then? Who's the acting solicitor general? It's probably Ed Needler. Um, now, Ed also interestingly didn't sign any of these briefs, which I find remarkable since this is his docket. Um, so, you know, my my I have a guess as to why, and I suspect you do too. Um, but you know, now he might 
come into the case. Um, but there is this whole really deep question about, you know, what is the relationship between the president and the solicitor general? Um, and, you know, in a case like this, in which you ha may have an acting solicitor general, acting, acting, Ed Needler, career person, um, but you have an administration that has, is one of its central ideas, you know, healthcare for everyone, and certainly not come wanting to leave its Justice Department position being that the entire Affordable Care Act should be struck down, um, you do have this question about how much can the president say to the double acting solicitor general in that area. And, you know, you had mentioned, Paul, a moment ago, the affirmative action cases in 2003. As I understand it, there was a little bit of that dynamic going on back then between the Solicitor General's office and the White House. Uh, I don't know if there's anything you want to talk about about that. Well, you know, I'll just talk about the issue generally, which is, you know, I think it's one of, and, you know, maybe I should have said this at the beginning, especially, you know, for folks that are less familiar with the Solicitor General's office. But, you know, one of the um, kind of really interesting aspects of the office is, you know, Neil and I just start talking about the office. You can start, you know, we're both growing a little nostalgic for our time there. It's a, it's a great office. The, the folks that work there are incredible. Um, and kind of consistent with everything we've said in the way it operates in its relationship with the courts uh, and the Supreme Court in particular, there's this kind of sense of kind of independence or being not entirely independent, but a little bit separate and apart. You know, people talk about it as, you know, the 10th justice or the 36th law clerk, but it, you know, it underscores that the office is, you know, really facing towards the court. Um, but then you look at the organizational chart and, you know, you, you look and the organizational chart says the solicitor general works for the attorney general, the attorney general works for the president. And so certainly my view that, you know, it's always open to the president um, to in any particular case say, you know, look, this is the position of the United States. And then it's open to the solicitor general to either kind of represent that position before the United States Supreme Court or to resign. But, you know, you don't get to say no um, you know, I'm going to countermand the president. That's not the way the org chart works. And I guess what I would say is, and, and, and I have no, you know, insights, you know, everything I know about what was going on in the Justice Department the last couple of months, I read in the papers. So I don't know exactly how things were working in, you know, the last administration, but I can speak to my own experience where, you know, you always understood that as a matter of at least my view of the separation of powers, the president could tell you what your position was going to be in any given case. And the beautiful thing was that it didn't happen. And you were kind of given this space to operate and to use your judgment, um, but understanding that you were doing it as part of the Justice Department and as part of an administration. And I, you know, I think that's one of these things where precisely because it's it's unwritten precisely because you don't see it on the org chart. Um, it's both kind of an amazing thing and worth thinking about, but also, you know, something that I think you got to work a little bit at to preserve. And so, you know, from that standpoint, I think it's, you know, I think it's great that, um, that the acting solicitor general is an alum of the office. Um, you know, I think that, you know, anybody who served in the office is going to have an appreciation uh, for the, the office, but also for kind of that, you know, that this, this little bit of a delicate dance because, you know, you don't want the president to be telling the Solicitor General what to do on a regular basis, but that power does exist, I think. I don't know, do you, do you agree with that, Neil? Um, yeah, I completely agree with that. And, you know, I, I guess, you know, my view is certainly the president can countermand the Solicitor General's, you know, view in a case. Um, though I do think it should be done expressly and openly. What I think, you know, one way in which the office can lose its power and stature as not an ordinary litigant is if you've got, you know, White House staffers calling up the Solicitor General and saying, well, I'd really like you to do X or Y, um, you know, which is, you know, something that the White House does for every other, 
you know, for almost everything else, obviously not prosecution decisions, but, you know, like some order to the ag department or something like that. Um, but I do think the Solicitor General's office is different in that sense. And, you know, you do, don't want that kind of subtle, informal, kind of breezy kind of way to, to, to creep into the office's decision making. I mean, one of the greatest things about the office, and then I think everyone, we should move on, but is the way in which the SG makes decisions. It's highly regularized. There is no stovepiping or secret conversations. All the different entities who are care about something write a memo to the Solicitor General and, how, and that memo is reviewed by several layers, the line attorney at the Solicitor General's office, then a career deputy, and then to the Solicitor General. So it's, um, it's a really wonderful way of making decisions. And so if you have any sort of extraneous phone call inputs or jawboning or something like that, I think it throws the whole thing off kilter. Um, so with that, I think there are a lot of questions from folks about the Supreme Court, um, the transition of the court. Neil, can I say one more thing before we transition? I, I know you, and I know we need to transition, but I just want to say one 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 thing more, which is just it just just because it follows directly from what you just said, which is you know I, the other thing I think that's important is for people to kind of think that you know there's there's a right way and there's a wrong way for a new administration to change its position in a way that's ultimately reflected in a Supreme Court brief. And you know, the right way to do it is, you know, if the underlying concern is that the new administration has a different policy and it doesn't like the policy of the last administration, it should change the policy. And then if it changes the policy, it's very easy for the Solicitor General to say, look, we have a new policy. Maybe you need to remand the case and let the lower court consider the new policy in the first instance. or poof, the policy just isn't there anymore, so the case is moot. I mean, all of those seem to me to be the right way to make the policy. And to your point, I think you know the danger that can come in, and I think the Solicitor General's Office House has to be careful about, is that somebody's trying to change the policy without actually changing the policy. They're just saying, hey, you know, the DC Circuit just struck down this rule. You know, I know ordinarily you'd appeal the rule or petition for Supreme Court review, but 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 if you don't, the rule will just go away. Yeah. And you know, it always struck me that the right answer there was like, that's great. Go tell the Secretary of Transportation. And if the rule goes away, I got plenty to keep me busy. But don't don't in the guise of having the Solicitor General's office make a legal determination actually smuggle in a policy determination. Anyways, I, I, I don't mean to digress, but that just seems like such an important point, especially during a transition. I just wanted to make it express. Totally right, Paul. I mean, I'd get calls from cabinet secretaries all the time, like, you know, don't appeal this, don't appeal that. They, you know, and I'm like, you know, if it's one of your rules, you can change it, <laughs> you know, take it away from me anytime you want. But they're afraid to do that and they want you to do their dirty work for them. And that's absolutely the wrong way to go. And I just, for, for viewers, want people to understand that that's about executive or agency decision making. There's a whole separate thing about when you're defending acts of Congress in which you don't have that discretion. And so, very famously, you've got Paul here who defended the McCain Feingold campaign finance reforms, even though that the administration, I don't think, was particularly happy about campaign finance regulation. But as Solicitor General, it was his duty to defend acts of Congress, and you couldn't have agency changes to it because they were congressional. Okay, with that, let's just spend a little bit, because I know people are so interested in, um, in talking about you know, the court right now, um, and maybe two different features of it. One is just coronavirus. Um, it's so weird. I mean, I've had two, two phone arguments. You've probably had 10 at this point. Um, and, uh, and, uh, you know, I find them, there's, there's one way in which they're, um, they're better in which is, first of all, you get to hear from Justice Thomas, you get to hear from some of the justices who don't ask as many questions. So that's just, um, uh, fascinating, interesting, and, and, uh, you know, on its, on its own, but it's also that you do sometimes get a sustained interaction with one justice over repeat questions in the way that in the normal Supreme Court arguments, usually some other justice would interrupt. So in that sense, it feels a little more like a court of appeals argument where there's only three and one of them is, you know, going after you for a while. And that can 
lead to, I think, sometimes a whole line of questioning that's deeper and more probing of a position. On the other side, I find, you know, the thing that at least, you know, I think that we do, one of the thing, reasons for our job is we go in and read the room and we are watching body language and we're watching, you know, intonation and, and so many things to try and understand is our position resonating. And on the phone, we're operating blind. And like, I find it hard to even know like when to stop and answer because like, I, I don't want to drone on for, you know, but I also don't know if I've satisfied at all the justice who's asking me a question because I can't look at them, I can't see them. So I find it um, overall a pretty, um, uh, a pretty challenging environment, but I don't know, Paul, what you think? Well, so I'll start with another upside of the new format, which is just, you know, I would, I, I typically drive myself into the court the morning of the argument. And so for a typical Supreme Court argument, I do have to deal with some anxiety about, you know, what's the traffic on the 14th Street Bridge going to look well, like? I'll give you my Uber account, man. No, but it doesn't matter if somebody else does the driving. The point is, like, you got to get there. And, you know, D.C. traffic, at least, you know, I live in Virginia, so D.C. traffic can be a challenge. And it's just something you worry about on the morning of argument. Um, you worry a little bit about what you're going to wear. Um, that's out the window, too. Nobody can, you know, nobody can see what you're wearing. Um, so in the sense of just being able to basically, you know, argue from home, um, there's something to like about that. Uh, but in all seriousness, I really do miss the, 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 the in-person arguments. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll say two things that I miss. I mean, one is really just very similar to what Neil's already said, but it's, it's not just that you can't read the room or the justice. I mean, and, that, and that's true. You know, you, you, you see a question in, 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 in a live argument, you can sort of see whether it's asked with a wry smile, whether it's asked with just a cold stone sober kind of look. And those are very different questions, even though every word of the question is exactly the same. But, but the biggest thing too is, you know, because of the way the Supreme Court, you know, processes cases and the fact that the justices don't really talk about the cases amongst themselves before the oral argument. You know, so much of oral argument is not just kind of reading um, the justice who's asking you the question, but how are the other justices reacting to that? Um, in a way, the effect is almost more dramatic when the other lawyer is arguing. Because, you know, I mean, I, you know, I remember a case that I argued against Neil when I was in the SG's office, and I knew my goose was cooked before I went up to the podium, because I could see during his argument, you know, some of the pushback that I was hoping to get wasn't there, and the kind of body language of the justices was, you know, very kind of favorable to the other side. And, and I find in a typical in-person argument, you can learn a lot about where the court is. Uh, just by watching them during the other person's argument. And you, you lose the visual on that entirely. Um, the second thing that I really miss is like, you know, we're, we're both blessed. We get the opportunity to argue in front of the Supreme Court on multiple occasions. But for me, and I think this is probably true for you too, Neil, for most of our clients, it's going to be their one and only chance to get to the Supreme Court of the United States. And part of the process is, going into the building, seeing the justices in action. Um, it's, you know, even win or lose, I think almost every one of my private sector clients that is that I've sort of been involved and in, they've been with me in the Supreme Court building, they've left with like a good feeling. Like, you know, because the justices are so well prepared um, and the building is very well designed to instill awe and the rest. And, and I just feel bad that they're kind of missing out on a big part of the experience. So that's one of the many reasons, you know, I hope we're, I hope we're back in person before too long. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. And also I would add to that the first time advocates, um, like I, one of my partners just argued for the first time, the Ford cases a couple of months ago. And, you know, he'd been looking so forward to this really free or engineered the strategy years ago to finally get to the Supreme Court. And he does, he gets a cert petition granted and then he's in jeans at home using his laptop target. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. 
definitely a, a loss on that side. Uh, you know, I think one other interesting thing about, and maybe this is drawing too much causality from it, but because so many more people, I think, are tuning into the arguments because they're live streamed, um, I do think like the justices are, they, they, their questions are darn good right now. I mean, they're, they're not, they're, you don't have as many follow-ups, but those initial questions I think are crafted you know, maybe they also know because they're going to have their three minutes to answer to ask their question. So I think it comes in with a bit more, um, you know, preparation than uh, than a more uh, spontaneous on the fly questioning. Um, so you know, I, I've noticed that. Um, what do you think about? Um, you know, we've gotten a bunch of questions from viewers uh, about you know who's going to step down. Is Breyer going to step down? Are others going to step down? Uh, I had the privilege of clerking for Justice Breyer. Um, you know, and I can't begin to speculate as to what he's going to do. The one thing I'd say is, you know, for for Justice Breyer, it's never been about him. Like he's all he's very much an institutionalist, someone who thinks about long term good of whatever institution he's in. And so I think that's really going to be the calculation for him. When is the appropriate time? I think, you know, given the kind of partisan rancor in the country over the last years, I think it would have been complicated um, for him. He would have worried about create, you know, having a whole war around it. Um, so I do think that kind of question will be, um, you know, something he's thinking about. Yeah, it's it's a great question. You know, obviously, you know Justice Breyer in a way that uh, that that I don't. Um, you know, I, I I would imagine it's something that you know he has to consider. Um, you know, I think uh, you know Justice Scalia um, obviously didn't make the decision, but I heard him talk about uh, the decision publicly. I'm not revealing any confidences, and you know, he sort of said like you, it's kind of human nature to take into account, you know, whether the person who's likely to replace you is going to be good for the institution if they're going to, you know, sort of spend the next, you know, 30 years, you know, rewriting everything you just wrote. I mean, there's all considerations that it just seems natural that a, a justice would take into account. I guess, you know, I, I just have this feeling, though, you know, we saw this with Justice Ginsburg. Um, you know, we saw it a little bit with Justice Thomas towards, you know, the end of the, the Trump administration. You're, you know, you're starting to see some of these, you know, people like talking about, you know, it's time for Justice Breyer to stop, step down. I, I think that's so unseemly. Um, now, you know, it, 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 it talks to important and debatable issues about how much power the Supreme Court has, the method of appointment. It, you know, so it's, I'm, I'm not saying that it's, um, you know, irresponsible or, or even, you know, maybe it's just entirely natural. But, but I guess it is sort of unseemly. And so kind of my instinct, I'd be curious if you have a different view, Neil. My instinct is, you know, if for your own reasons, you'd like Justice Breyer to retire, my advice would be don't talk about it. I mean, oh, he, he's going to make whatever decision he's going to make. And I don't think you're going to advance the ball even an inch. And it might just roll back a little bit um, if, you know, if, if, if people are sort of suggesting it. I, I think this is something where, kind of, you know, the less said, particularly for people who are kind of secretly rooting for a retirement, I mean, the, the less said, the better is kind of my view. But I don't know. If it's I totally agree. And, you know, I remember some columns that were written by people saying, you know, certain justice should retire and so on. And I was horrified then. I'm horrified. No, these are human beings, after all. These are not, you know, like robots that were, you know, software upgrade that we're thinking of trying to replace or something. Um, you know, at the same time, you know, it is engendered a little bit by a ridiculous antiquated Article 3 that uses lifetime tenure as opposed to, for example, 18 year terms or something like that. I mean, which could sidestep a lot of this. So, you know, um, it's, it's predictable, but unfortunate, um, I think. Uh, you know, we don't have too much more time, Paul, but, you know, I know a lot of people are interested in some thoughts about impeachment um, and, and so on. Um, and maybe just one thing, um, since you're such a student of the chief, um, and we're seeing, you know, the chief is, according to reports, you know, declined to preside over this trial. Um, and uh, I'm curious if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, I, I do, Neil. And thanks for asking. And then I want to ask you kind of more broadly about your thoughts about uh, about the situation. But but let me just first talk about kind of the chief's decision. Um, 
and, and I think there's two things that are really important to kind of keep in mind. Um, the first is that his decision to not preside, um, you know, I don't think really addresses the separate issue of whether or not the Senate has the power to try a sort of former officer. Um, you know, I think they're, they're obviously related issues, but I really think they're pretty separate because the thing about the chief's role in impeachment it is, is it is very textually specific to an impeachment trial of the president of the United States. And, you know, Donald Trump is no longer the president of the United States. So presumably, you know, his view of that clause of the Constitution is probably as simple as that. I, I can't obviously speak for him, but, but it's certainly based on an interpretation of that clause. And that clause really doesn't address kind of a completely separate question about whether the Senate can, um, you know, can, can have a trial under these circumstances, whether that's appropriate, whether that's constitutional. So, so I don't think the chief is sort of foreshadowing a view of that separate question. And I think if he thought he were, you know, he, I, I think he'd have done something different, whether make a different decision or just explain um, himself, you know, in writing or something. But, but I think, you know, it, it's probably fair to say that even he views it as a separate question. But the second thing I want to highlight, and, and this, you know, is directly related to my teaching at the law school over the years. One of the things that I've really been um, trying to impress upon people in thinking about the separation of powers is that constitutional law gets made and constitutional constitutional decisions get made in places other than Supreme Court merits decisions. I mean, you know, sometimes when the president decides not to take an action because the president thinks that action is unconstitutional, there's constitutional law being made. Sometimes when the Senate takes an action or refrains from an action because of their view of what the impeachment clauses provide, they're making constitutional law. And so, I think the chief just made some super interesting constitutional law. Um, there's no explanatory decision that goes with it. Um, you know, my view is it, you know, it, it didn't get to the Supreme Court and probably wouldn't because of the political question doctrine. We can talk more about that later if we have time. But I think the chief has just made clear that he reads that clause as being specific to the current president of the United States. You know, that makes some sense because I think that provision may be in there because there's a perception that the vice president would preside over the Senate trial and would have a conflict of interest. Um, you know, if you get if, if you get a job promotion because the person is conflicted, maybe you shouldn't be, you know, the impartial adjudicator. So anyways, I, I just find it super interesting um, that, you know, by making this decision and again, without at least based on what I've seen so far, any explanation for it, um, he really is making some pretty interesting constitutional law. Uh, but there's a lot of interesting constitutional arguments that are floating back and forth in the context of the, the current impeachment. There's a lot that's unprecedented about it. Um, I don't think any officer has been impeached twice before. Um, you know, I don't think we've squarely confronted the question we're confronting in the context of a president anyway before. So, I mean, what do you make of it all, Neil? Well, I think uh, I 100% think the chief is right in not presiding over this impeachment the way that it was structured. Now, had the trial began before January 20th, um, McConnell had blocked it, but had it begun on January 18th or 19th, then I think the chief would preside. And then there'd be an interesting question, should he continue to preside afterwards? Um, but I think, uh, I don't see any other way really of reading the text and precisely because the rationale is almost certainly the one you identify, which is the chief justice should be there because the vice president otherwise would preside and would be have a conflict of interest. So I think this was an easy call. I'm glad the chief made it the way he did. I mean, it's always great to have the chief presiding. I think he adds a measure of gravitas and solemnity to the thing, but I just don't think that's what the constitution um, says. Then you have this other question, 
which I do think you're absolutely right, Paul. It's a separate question. Can former officials uh, be tried? And, you know, already you have the problem that, you know, you have Senator Cotton and some others who are saying you can't. Well, one thing is, is of course, this isn't exactly a truly totally former official because you do have the, you know, the impeachment process starting beforehand. And then you've got the text of the constitution in article one, which has two different punishments if you're impeached. One is you're removed from the office and the other is you can be by further vote disqualified from future office holding, a lifetime ban. And it's hard to really, I think, understand the text uh, if you don't think that a former official can be uh, subject to the punishment of a lifetime ban because otherwise, you basically everyone who's facing an impeachment or been impeached um, or you know have been impeached or about to face removal would just resign and then terminate the proceedings against her or him and the lifetime ban provision would be meaningless. It would literally never be kicked in because nobody would think would have an incentive to do so. After all, the lifetime ban vote is just a simple majority of the Senate. And so the conviction vote is two thirds. So there's not really any circumstance to, in my mind in which someone who after they faced a two thirds conviction uh, vote and lost it is gonna hang on and say, well, maybe I'll get 51 people so I can serve again. That's just not plausible. So every person would resign after the conviction vote, if not before, um, and then that clause would be meaningless. So that's one problem with, I think, the argument that Senator Cotton has advanced and Rand Paul have advanced. Um, and then the other is just historically, um, at the time of the founding, uh, the English history was to impeach former officials. I mean, most famously, the governor of Bengal, Hastings, um, a notorious scoundrel uh, was uh, impeached after he left. And that was actually the one instance in the Philadelphia Convention debates in Madison's notes that is mentioned is, uh, is the Hastings impeachment. So this was a well-known case um, and really nothing, no evidence to the contrary. And there's a little bit of precedent. It hasn't been done much, but you know, so Secretary Belknap um, was uh, uh, the Secretary of War in 1876 as a former official, um, you know, impeachment proceedings were begun against him. Uh, and there, you know, there are a couple others. It's rare as it should be. I mean, but Donald Trump was a rare president. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, I find it really, um, you know, interesting. Um, I'm going to be sort of teaching this in one of my upcoming classes. Um, and, you know, we're going to try to examine um, all of the sort of sources on both sides of this. Um, I think it is what makes some of these questions about impeachment so interesting is because of a Supreme Court case, the case I like to think of as the other Nixon case, mm -hmm. uh, the Walter Nixon against the United States case. Um, you know, it's pretty clear that the Supreme Court will not get involved in these issues. I'm not saying that somebody won't try to get them involved, that somebody won't bring a lawsuit. And I suppose there's an argument that you could distinguish the Nixon case because the Walter Nixon case the Supreme Court said that issues of impeachment are non-justiciable political questions, but they were focused on the question of whether what the Senate did in that particular case was really a trial because they kind of kicked some of the fact finding to a subcommittee of the Senate. And the challenge in that case brought by a former judge was that's not really a trial. The, Senate, the whole Senate has to hit, sit for the entirety of the impeachment. And the Supreme Court, you know, by, by a pretty good margin said, no, that's a political question. We're not going to get dragged into that. So it's going to be open for somebody to say, if they want to, that this question is separate from the trial question. But my strong, you know, sense is that, you know, the, the courts, starting with the first district court that addresses this up to the Supreme Court, is going to say, no, thank you, political question. Do you have any different view, Neil? 100% political question. Yeah, totally, totally. Well, I think we're getting pretty close to our, 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 our time together, Neil. Anything else you want to sort of share or before, yeah, the, we, uh, before we the close one it off? I wanted, the one I want, you know, there's a lot of students watching. And Paul, you had mentioned before 
um, a case which you'd argued against me, um, in which you said, uh, you know, that you saw the justices, uh, you know, receptive. You know, I went first, and they were appeared receptive. You know, that case was just for everyone the Guantanamo cases. And we've had, Paul, you and I, some pretty heated cases over the years, the Affordable Care Act, um, uh, you know, as well. And I think it's real important for folks to know, um, you know, we're good friends. And, um, you know, that's one of the things I love about this bar. And I love about you in particular, and I love about Georgetown is um, we can be on the opposite sides of really hard stuff that we care tremendously about. Um, and, you know, with every fiber of our souls, but respect the person on the other side who's making the other argument. Um, because you know, our profession at the end of the day is all about um, precisely that. So you've taught me so much in addition to teaching so many Georgetown students. And I just wanted to take this opportunity to publicly thank you for your service to, to Georgetown and the bar, as well as of course, to, to just being such a great person and colleague for me. Well, Neil, thank you. That's very kind of you. I would say, that yeah, the lessons that you learn in arguing cases um, a, a, against people, and I think just having the perspective that you know, yeah, we both care deeply about this, but we're both really helping the court in the long run get to the right answer by presenting the best possible argument. I think really helps kind of keep the focus where it should be, and you know, allow folks like us to be very good friends. Um, even though, you know, we sometimes end up on the opposite sides of the V. Uh, the other thing that makes it great, of course, is that, you know, every once in a while we end up on the same side of the V. Um, and, you know, the only thing, you know, kind of better of, you know, than arguing a case kind of against you is getting to argue a case with you or, you know, uh, be co-counsel in a case. We've had the opportunity to do that as well. Um, and if anything, that's, you know, like I said, that's, that's, that's even better. And, you know, I don't want to get too sappy, but I do think, that there's something to be said for the SG's office and the Supreme Court bar, you know, is a little bit of a model for kind of mixing it up, um, being passionate, not pulling punches in the forum where punches are appropriate, uh, and then, you know, still understanding that a decision is going to be made and that the person on the other side is indeed a person. Um, I think all those are lessons that, you know, that, that you know, so like, we, I'm, I'm, sort of conscious that like, as you said, we're, we're in our profession, we're all helped by the fact that the Supreme Court is gonna decide the cases and they're the ultimate arbiter. So that takes some of the pressure off. But I do think there, there is kind of a generalizable lesson here. Um, and, uh, and so I do hope, uh, I do hope the, the, the SG's office and, and the Supreme Court bar can be a little bit of a model in that respect. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you all for, for watching. Thanks, everyone.